I, I like that Crystal Carmen trademarked her name. <laughs> Sorry, you you go ahead. I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt. No, you're good. Um, I chose I chose this this subject first in the Taboo Talk series because it was the least intimidating to me, if I'm honest. Because I've been married, I've had long term relationships, and like have an you know experience with traditional commitment. I've had weird non traditional right. It's so, like to me, it was like the least intimidating. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see because this this is the subject that's probably the hardest for me to identify what's taboo to most people because I've navigated the space for such a long time. So I'm really excited specifically to have Nate here because I think that he has a lot more experience than I with traditional relationships. I think it's going to be kind of cool. So we're just going to chat. Like I have some prompts for us and some articles and people ask questions on Facebook that I'm going to repeat. And we are just literally going to chat and talk and have an opinion and feel free to go off and Google stuff and come back. And, you know, we're just going to hang out. Um, the one like ground rule I did want to kind of lay out there is that the intention for me at least is not for us to have like, there's not an intention for us to debate. Like if we disagree, that's even better. Let's talk about the reasons that we disagree, but there's never going to be a point where we're like trying to convince each other or something. If we get to that point, I will probably get very cheerleadery and girly and say, all right, time out. Let's take a deep breath. Um, but I don't really think that's going to be the case because you guys are all really chill. Um, so for starters, marriage, commitment, like what what is both of y'all's relationship to those words and those ideals? Like, do you love them, hate them, indifferent? <clears throat> you want to start, Nate? Marriage and commitment? They, what, do you, what do you mean what's my relationship with that word? Um, yeah, well, I think your smile and your giggle starts to give us an idea. Like when somebody says to you, well, okay, we'll be really specific. When somebody says, Hey Nate, are you going to get married anytime soon? Like what's your immediate reaction? Uh, the concept of marriage and commitment. I'm a huge fan of <laughs> huge fan. Um, I also acknowledge that it's not for everybody, but personally, I think it's, um, there's a lot of really great benefits that can be had from, especially from commitment. I don't yeah. know how far, I don't know how far to dive. Uh, <clears throat> as deep as you want. Uh, I don't, let's, I, okay. Well, I'm, so when, like if people ask you, when along you're here. Married, where, where do you go with that? Like, is that a comfortable question for you? Or are you like, because my reaction when somebody says, "When are you going to get married?" I'm like, "Probably never. I'm probably never going to do that again." Yeah. I'd be able to it, but like that's like I steer the question more towards my relationships. Like for me, marriage is not like the end game that I'm going for. And I know that you said that you respect people who do, but like, what's your personal relationship to that concept? Um, I, I I really I just I like the idea of partnership. I like the idea. Uh, so. If somebody asks me if I'm going to get married one day, that is, it's not necessarily my, my end game. I look at marriage for me as, uh, as kind of a gateway down a, a new, the, the once I pass through, I enter kind of a new phase of life where um, it's no longer just me, but it's a we situation where I'm playing on a team where I have somebody who has my back and I have their back where we are like ruthlessly committed and faithful to each other and to each other's um, growth and progress as a human being. And uh, I just love that. I love that idea of two humans choosing to come together, choosing to spend the rest of their lives together, choosing to fight for each other's dreams, choosing to um, just be, be each other's advocate in for life and for, I don't know. It's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful concept to me. Uh, See, I they, love it. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I absolutely love that description. And I would say beautiful props to you for putting it so incredibly well with a couple of small alterations is kind of my relationship to that. Um, when somebody says marriage and commitment to answer your question, Sunny, um, it is that ruthlessly committed. It's that incredibly faithful, but it doesn't necessarily have to involve just two and it doesn't necessarily have to involve marriage. And those are the two biggest things for me is commitment and marriage are two incredibly different things because commitment is a personal choice that you make while marriage is a legal commitment that you make. And that separation 
is extraordinarily important to me, not least of which because when somebody says, when are you getting married? My two answers are, well, about five years ago and when it's legal. <laughs> and so that kind of makes it a complicated question. Right, yeah. right. That's why uh, towards the beginning, uh, I favored, I understand that, like I said, marriage isn't for everybody. And it, unfortunately, it's a legal thing and I wish it wasn't. Hmm. I wish it wasn't. I wish it was, uh, I, I mean, it's a religious right, typically, if you go back, like it's, if you look at the history of marriage, it's not, um, it's not based on like legality stuff. Like a lot of the reasons people got married in, in the past were, it, uh, I'm not I'm probably not doing the best job of explaining this, but it, throughout history, the meaning of marriage and the importance of marriage has, has changed and the definition of marriage has changed. Um, generations ago, it was a, like, it was a bartering system. Like a man would give up his, his daughter and it would be like a trade of land and goods and two families merging together. Be traded back in the day. Yeah. And, um, and like in the fifties, it was, uh, you got married so you could have a family and it was not uncommon for like men to have a mistress. And like, I, I'm not, I'm not saying what we expect from marriage and how we define marriage now in the 21st century is very different than how it's ever been defined in the past. And it's definitely changed and evolved. And, the way that we look at marriage now, I think, has a very Judeo-Christian influence. Yes, and let's that, like that. I'm glad you kind of started to go there, Nate, because that's kind of where I. That's kind of why yeah. I started where I did. Is I think that, and we're all. I think we're all probably in the same age group. I'm 33, so I think we're all probably in like the the 30ish range. Um, the the way that we were brought up is kind of on the cusp of like I know my parents were brought up in what you were talking about the 50s mentality of a man and a woman need to come together to create a household to fit the Judeo-Christian model. And I think that because if I can speak for myself, having technology around and seeing all of the other other cultures and having things shift so much around us and the LGBT movement and equality and all of these different things, the idea of the Judeo-Christian traditional model of marriage doesn't really serve. That's why I say I'm not necessarily having marriage as my end game because that doesn't necessarily serve the life I want. What you were describing, Nate, of partnership, that's what I really strive for. So what happens, because Nate, I know you're passionate about this particular topic and the idea of right. really committing. So what would happen, what's, what is predictable or what do we see the world looking like if marriage stops being the end game? Is that risky? Would that be a good thing? Does it really matter? Is it necessary? Like, what do you guys think? I'm interested in Nate hearing, hearing Nate, but I also, I really want to make sure you bookmark your thoughts, Andrea, because I think you probably have some cool stuff here too. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Andrea. Well, there's actually a really intriguing book out there that I absolutely love. It's called The History of the Wife. And if you're uh, somebody who uh, reads a ton, then it's a gorgeous one to read, though it is not necessarily the easiest read out there. Um, but one of the things that it really talks about in that is how marriage has really been as much of a class issue as it has about a property issue. Because it used to be when marriage was just a legal bartering system, it didn't really matter if you didn't have a lot of money. And so there were a lot more love marriages when money and property weren't involved. And it was really the aristocracy that was concerned about the price of a wife and how good of a wife could you be and were you going to produce children and all that kind of stuff. And so part of, oh, thank you for the link there. Um, so part of what kind of created the whole idea of a marriage being that property transaction was the idea of creating the, the aristocracy or being a part of the aristocracy. And so when you talk about air, marriage being an end game, you're also talking about so much of the socio-political connection that comes with that. And a part of the trying to be what everybody else expects and trying to be something that is, well, that's what's supposed to happen if you're one of the people that we should be following. And so that societal expectation of the end game is so tied up with the economic expectation of an end game and the fact that you had to have at least two working individuals up until about the 50s. I mean, it was not unusual for there to be two working partners in a family all the way back to medieval times or further behind. And the whole idea that one person stayed at home to raise the kids, totally new in a lot of situations. Yeah. Totally agree. So yeah, it's just marriage not being the end game, I think does feel risky because it's what a lot of us were raised with. I know where I grew up, that was 
most definitely the question is, so when are you getting married and who are you getting married to? Still is in some cases, <laughs> um, but it's, I think a lot of people are afraid to not have an expected question, answer to that question, because when you don't give the answer people expect, there's a lot more questions that some people aren't comfortable answering. Yeah, we're in, I think we're in a really interesting period right now where marriage is still a cultural expectation. Mm -hmm. Like it's still a kind of a cultural standard. And I personally, and I'm sure you guys as well, would like to be involved in redefining what that means. Redefining, because like you just mentioned, marriage and marriage has evolved. That word has evolved over time, over centuries. And we're in a new, a very interesting period of the world right now where things are changing really, really quickly. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how, how the idea of marriage evolves and changes over the next few years and decades. I think that totally starts to link into as well, um, which could go off on a whole tangent, but the idea of family, because marriage often is the beginning of, because once you get married, what's the next question for most of us? When marriage is the family? foundation of, of yeah. a family. Yeah. yeah. So if, if we as a culture start to redefine what marriage looks like and loosen up our ideals about it or shift to where that's no longer the automatic question, then what impact does that then have on family um, as, a, as an outcome? Uh, I think that's been a, a two-layered question because the legal definition of a family is often so far behind what somebody actually considers a family that no matter how committed or how much society may expect marriage to be something, until there's some kind of legal framework to support that, it's a rough situation. Yeah, and family, like I said, that could go off on a whole tangent. Because like for me, my, most of my family is chosen. The people who I call family are people that don't legally have rights to say that, but they're my family nonetheless, right? And I see that happening more and more. When I explain that to people, I get a lot, it's a lot less weird or um, confused responses. And that's still not normal. And I know that that stems from me surrounding myself with people because that's how I am um, that don't necessarily strive for marriage as the end game when they have partnerships and relationships. Um, one of the questions that came up on Facebook that was super liked and endorsed was the idea of marriage as a choice, meaning there's alternatives. So we're already kind of circling that right now. So if, if traditional marriage isn't necessarily, you know, what a lot of people are moving towards, what are some of the other choices that you guys see people having as an alternative to the traditional marriage? Do you want to start, Nate? Oh, this is just going to get so delicate. I can already tell. We're going to walk a tightrope. Here's, here's the thing. Right now, it's the three of us. And I can speak pretty confidently that you're not going to say anything that's going to trigger oh, I know. I know. I know. I know. I'm, not, I'm not worried about it. I'm, I'm, but I, I know this is being recorded. And so I like really want to choose my words carefully. I do. Like, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to. Well, this, I mean, to be fair, this is your business. Like Nate yeah. is in the business of love, whereas Andrew and I just have opinions. <laughs> um, so yeah, marriage is not the end all be all of relationship structures. And uh, like, obviously people cohabitate, there's different, I mean, what do you mean? What, what do you mean as far as alternatives, like alternatives to marriage, there's. Yeah. So if you choose yeah. marriage, what other things could you choose? Because so it was specifically, you know, Natasha, Nate, specifically Natasha was like, marriage is a choice and people act like we don't really have a choice. But right. then the conversation moved into, okay, well, if it's a choice, that means that you have an alternative option. Yeah. So is the single equal broken? Is staying no. single forever no. a legitimate choice that allows you to participate in society fully no. and experience all of the bliss that everybody else gets? I think, I think people what who are happens? married sometimes project that message to everybody else, but like, there's no reason you, Sonny's like, or not Sonny, uh, Tony's giving us some great answers. Tony, you're welcome to jump in here. Co cohabitation, domestic partnerships, chosen families, like Sunny mentioned, are all alternatives. I totally agree. And um, even being in a re like, even defining your relationships and having relationships that aren't lifelong relationships, and being in a relationship that's like, hey, we our paths are we're moving down the same path right now, and let's do move down that path together. And if one of us decides to take another path, then we can choose to like end the relationship as it's structured now and 
like maybe we pick somebody else along the way or maybe like we pick up somebody else in the future after that period of time of, of us together is is over um i think people are like are a lot of people are really reconsidering i've heard arguments of like oh i wonder is monogamy broken like can are are humans naturally monogamous and can we stay committed for a lifetime and is that even in our biology and should we even be considering that and um and those are like valid questions to ask and a lot of them a lot of the answers are conditional upon your belief system how you're raised what you want from your life i don't believe that there's right or wrong answers i know that there are answers that um that i prefer personally and there's also relationship structures that based off based on the studies have a higher success rate compared to others um but once again, like if you're committed to the type of relationship that you want, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to have it. I think one of the first questions you should ask when you're starting a relationship with somebody is straight up, like, what are you looking for in a relationship? Some people are, well, what they want right now is casual sex. And there's nothing wrong with having casual sex as long as it's consensual casual sex. And some people are looking for just like, uh, dating relationship and some people are looking for a lifetime commitment and like there i don't think that there's a right or wrong answer i just think the honest answer is the right answer and i love that phrase that the honest answer is the right answer because it is so very true that really it seems the the consistent thing about or any relationship that works of any form or fashion is communication and i'm not just talking a heavily committed lifelong relationship or even a short-term relationship because there is immense value in a short-term relationship if you're, it's entered into thoughtfully. Um, but really it comes down to communication and honesty and openness with the other individual or individuals in that relationship, no matter what the structure is. So I think the alternative to marriage isn't necessarily A, B, or C. The alternative to marriage is being honest about what you want, not about what's expected. Mm. Well said. Can I piggyback on um, Can I piggyback on Damien's question in the in the chat? You can veggie back off of it, sure. Yeah, he. I'll veggie back off of it. I'm not gonna kill the piggy. I just want to write it. <laughs> well, that could go so many ways. Yeah. So Damien asked, "What What's the answer to is monogamy broken?" And that was actually kind of one of the things on the list. Let's go into that. So, yeah, is monogamy broken? Can Can people um, be monogamous? What do you think? I personally believe that monogamy is not broken. I believe monogamy is an amazing, uh, a really great relationship structure if people choose that. And the reason that it's often perceived as being broken, in my opinion, is that there's a severe lack of training um, or skill development in what it takes to create a workable and monogamous relationship that actually flourishes and that that really thrives so in my experience um most people if you i like to think of romantic love as a skill a lot of people see it's a feeling or it's a verb or whatever I, I think more than anything it's a skill set it's and most of us learn the the skills that are important to us through um the role models and examples that we have access to through teachers through mentors and through study and the honest truth is that the majority of us don't have really great examples and role models of what really healthy monogamous love can look like. So we've got a whole bunch of millions of people in the world who are out there trying to make a relationship work and they have no, it's like they're trying to play the piano, but they've never had a piano teacher sit down and explain the theory behind piano. Or they're trying to speak Spanish and the only experience speaking Spanish that they have is watching Sesame Street. You know, they've never had a tutor. They've never lived in the country. They've never experienced the culture. They've never like really got generously exposed to what an amazing piano sounds like. They've never heard a Beethoven or they've never like, it's, so in my opinion, monogamy is actually really workable and can be a really beautiful relationship structure if people are willing to learn the skills and the tools and the principles required to create a thriving monogamous relationship. And um, awesome. yeah, so that's kind of where I stand on is monogamy broken. I think that the only thing that is really broken about monogamy is uh, is us not really knowing how to make it work 
Yeah. Well, and let's so let's so it's taboo talk, right? So let's let's kind of swerve off of that. And <laughs> Andrea, talk Andrea's it. like itching. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, go for it, Andrew, because I've got other <laughs> questions, but let's go for it. What do you got? So I think monogamy is broken in the sense that the expectation of monogamy and the expectation of monogamy as a default is absolutely broken completely because the expectation that that be the default, that that is a relationship, that ownership is a part of monogamy or ownership should be a part of any relationship is so utterly broken that it is incredibly damaging. To what do you mean by ownership? What was that? What do you mean by ownership? I mean the expectation that when you are in a relationship with somebody that you own something about them or they own something about you and that you have a right to their feelings or you have a right to uh, make determinations for them. I mean, just because I am married does not mean that... Now, that's not to say that you can't make partnership decisions and that you can't have some kind of... you know, have that relationship especially when you choose to do so. I have some very good friends who are very willingly submissive to their partners, but it is a willing choice. It's not, well, you and I have been seeing each other for three weeks, so I'm going to feel like I have been violated that you even looked at somebody else, even though we haven't had that conversation. Mm -hmm. there's, a, the, there's a clean oh. difference between a choice to be in a dom submissive relationship, right? Which is another totally taboo subject that happens all the time right people choose to be in that type of an environment there's a difference between that and the automatic kind of um and i see it with i mentor kids who are in like you know, like the age range of like 15 to 18 and i hear it come out of their mouths all the time it's like they're you're right there's like this sense of ownership like oh he's mine and i'm his and like your your his heart is mine and that kind of thing and it's it's just a verbiage thing but it does breed a certain mentality so this is this is exactly what i what i was talking about by skills principles and tools is that 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 idea of ownership that you own your partner or that there's you have some sort of stake or claim over what they can say do think feel whatever that is a that is one of probably the most prominent and prevalent uh mistakes that people make in a relationship and i don't think that it might be perpetuated in monogamous relationships but i don't think that, that that's part of the definition of monogamy is that you're surrendering yourself and your ability to choose and make decisions for yourself to somebody else. I think that maybe culturally that idea has been pushed for some yeah. mistakenly, but yeah. just because you're in a monogamous relationship, that's an unhealthy relationship, regardless of your relationship structure. And that comes so, up in friendships too, right? You see that oh, it with comes like up in all sorts of relationships, yeah. but, but lumping it in and saying that that's like what happens when you're monogamous, I would disagree with. Well, and I think that's really the cultural definition of monogamy versus the ideal definition of monogamy because in an ideal monogamous relationship that's not broken and i a, a monogamous relationship where two people are making the completely free choice to be monogamous with one another that's not broken but the cultural expectation of monogamy completely and utterly broken okay i, think I can agree with that i think that's an important distinction though yeah yeah i mean the number of times somebody will freak out when i say the phrase platonic wife and then say something about each of our husbands. It's like, well, what does your husband think about that? <laughs> or what does your husband think about the fact you've got a tattoo? It's like, it's my body. Right. Never mind if he actually sat with me during it, but still my body, not his. Yeah, and a lot of that's cultural and media driven because I, I get the same stuff. I have people ask me, people assume I'm straight and they ask me what my husband thinks of my short hair. Doesn't he miss touching and playing with it? Like people on the plane next to me have straight up asked me this, mm -hmm. right? And I, you know, that guy has a whole bunch of implications, but the, for the context of this conversation, they're assuming that I have somebody and that they get a say in how I manage my body. And I'm not discounting people who choose to gift their partner that sort of say over them. When I was married, my ex-husband really liked long hair. And there was a point where I kept my hair long as a gift to him, but it was my choice, right? It wasn't something that he demanded of me or expected of me. And he eventually was like, honey, cut it. It's too much work, you should just cut it. And I did. <laughs> well, one of my one of my exes actually, but she's still an extraordinarily good friend. One of her favorite things to do is she actually carries around a sock. And anytime anybody says, well, what does your husband think? Or is that okay? Or anything like that. She me. can holds the sock up and says, Dobby is a free elf. Yes. <laughs> I was, I was either going to go Dobby or was going to go hand puppet. And either way, I was going to be very excited. Oh, uh, you guys are funny. But, I mean, that's, I mean, <laughs> honestly, one of my favorite games to play with my pod, my family, 
is we will sit and watch a movie or listen to the radio and just point out every single little piece of ownershipy language that comes out of those. Like Love Actually, which is a movie I absolutely adore, but the lesson of that movie is basically the less a woman talks, the more attractive she is. Like, <laughs> Uh, that's a problem, but it's so deeply embedded in so much of culture that it really, it the assumption of ownership really comes hand in hand with the assumption of monogamy. Hello, Nate's hip. Hi. <laughs> Amy Novakowski is watching us, and she said, to be honest, in the long hair example, I don't know that the normal everyday person, they would get the difference between keeping their hair long for him or for her. I'm not quite sure what you mean about that, Amy. But you put a lot of time to clarify that out. So I just wanted to acknowledge it. If you want to clarify, feel free. Um, in the meantime, so let's talk a little bit about, so monogamy, I think we kind of came to a consensus, even though that wasn't necessarily a requirement, that, that the idea of monogamy is broken, but that there is still hope for monogamous relationships. Um, what about people who just don't jive with monogamy? So one of the things that I know um, doesn't get talked about a lot or does get brought up a lot of like, there's still a huge part of, especially American society that freaks out is the idea of ethical non-monogamy. Um, and I can post some links to definitions of that, but just to kind of summarize, it's the idea of, of choosing and creating an environment with a partner where monogamy is not part of the dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, who want, does anybody have something that they want to say about that? I think it's a completely and utterly valid choice as long as communication is at the basis and respect is at the basis of any of those interactions. I mean, the number one question I probably get when talking about ethical non-monogamy um, is, well, isn't that just cheating with permission? And that is something that just frustrates me because cheating is being dishonest and ethical non-monogamy is about having that honesty and having that basis of communication. And there's as many people in non-monogamous relationships who do so and have communication issues. But I think that's the biggest differentiation is it's not cheating with permission. It's being open and honest and communicative with all of your partners or even being single and having that particular preference. Yeah, I, I think the more I talk about this subject with people kind of one on one in enclosed environments, the more I realize that there's actually a lot more people than I think the average Joe would guess that have a, a situation that is some form of ethical non monogamy in the relationship. It just doesn't get talked about very often. One, because we're a society that doesn't talk about sex very much. And it's really a conversation about your sex life, which in some cases just isn't appropriate, right? Um, and two, because it's people immediately react and have judgments and, and go into that kind of conversation about it um Nate so, was, go ahead Andrea I was just gonna say I noticed Amy's comment of um I don't think the average person has the communication and trust still, skills to pull off non-monogamy I think this goes back really well to what Nate was talking about of communication skills and the skills of relationships really having a huge part and a huge impact but really the fact is if you don't have the communication and trust to pull off non-monogamy then you probably don't have the communication and trust to pull off a communicative, respectful, monogamous relationship. I mean, because it's really based in your expectations of, or your communication of expectations of a partner. And if you can't communicate your expectations to multiple partners, then communicating it to one partner is still going to be a problem. Yeah. And I, I, I would say having experience in both spaces, I would say that um, it takes more communication and more self-awareness and more effort to maintain an, eth an ethical non-monogamous relationship because oftentimes you're managing more than one partner and more than one person's feelings. So it does take an extra amount of effort. Um, and I agree that I think most people who shouldn't do one probably can't do the other as well, right? So it's it, it kind of starts to merge the two conversations. Um, and, and Damien has a good point that the people who are unskilled in the first place probably don't know they're not skilled. Like they don't have the the awareness to necessarily realize that that's a root issue anyway. Um, so <clears throat> yeah. Nate, what do you have? Do you have any, anything to add? Um, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. Uh, I yes. know one of your conversations, Nate, to kind of poke you a little bit, cause I know some of your, 
your passions is integrity as being an important foundation and intentionally spending time together as being an important foundation of relationships. And in my experience, when there's ethical non-monogamy present, those two things are almost taken to another level. So in, in a healthy ethical non-monogamous situation, um, communication becomes really big and really clear boundaries get set so that people can manage that. And as a result, oftentimes there's very intentional time spent together to manage the multiple partners. Um, but in some cases that could almost increase the level of attention to some of those pillars that you refer to as being a foundation of any yeah. solid romantic relationship. Have you ever heard of Metcalf's law? Tell us about it. It's the idea that um, it's a, it's, it's a technical uh, term, but essentially the idea is that if you have two computers talking to each other, the communi the connection is really simple. But with every extra data point or computer or node that you add to the to the um, to the system, the complexity grows exponentially. And um, really well, actually, that's really well said. I good job. I knew that one, and I wasn't going to try to do it. So thank you for taking that. That was really yeah, well. Yeah, you're good. And so, uh, just I think that there. I'm trying to find a really the right way to say this. Um, I think ethical non-monogamy is definitely a workable relationship structure. I think that there's a really strong cultural push towards monogamy and monogamous behaviors. And having a, an ethical non-monogamous relationship oftentimes becomes very difficult, even when we consciously know that, that monogamy isn't the relationship structure, structure we want to choose. We're still influenced by the culture of monogamy. And um, for example, uh, I, I interviewed, I sat down and interviewed a polygamous family, very religious, very conservative, one man, three wives, all very like empowered women making conscious choices. It wasn't a polygamous situation where they had been like manipulated as children and married off at the age of 12. It was like, full-grown adult women making the choice to be in this relationship. It was really fascinating interview. And um, they admitted that like that relationship structure challenges them in a way that they could never be challenged in a monogamous situation and that they experience sometimes extreme jealousy or um, they're just confronted in ways that a lot of people are never confronted when they are involved in a, just a regular monogamous relationship. Uh, not regular. I should remove the word regular from that, but in a monogamous relationship. And so I think it's, it's in my experience, what I've witnessed, and I'll admit that I haven't had a ton of ex experience personally with this, and there's not a whole huge net network of people that um, I'm in, that I am associated with that lives like a polyamorous or a polygamous or a polyandrous lifestyle. Uh, but from what I can, what I've ex witnessed and experienced secondhand, um, th those relationships tend to like really struggle a lot and oftentimes fall apart even more frequently than a, a monogamous relationship because of it. It's not, and it's not a universal thing, but I think because of the complexity and the nuance required and like uh, Amy and Damien were saying earlier, the, the fact that so many people, are, they are, they haven't developed the skills to even manage one partner and, um, managing more than one partner is uh, is more complex. I'm not saying it can't work. I'm just saying like it requires a lot of education and a lot of uh, effort to make it work. It's it's more difficult. I think in some ways though. So I have a background in IT. So going back to Metcalf's law, the idea that the more connection points you have, the more it is to manage. The more complex a server I have, the more I'm going to check in on it and check the air load because I know that it's a complex server. So the more points you add to a relationship, I think that in some ways, the the more attention you pay to pay to it, whereas right. in a traditional relationship, society makes it very easy um, to start taking your spouse for granted, to take your partner for granted. And when you have a non-traditional relationship um, in today's society, at least, I think that it probably also ups the level of attention that people are paying to those relationships, yeah. um, especially I, when public about it. I don't want my comment to come across as being like, this is wrong or bad or anything like that. It's just, it's different and it requires a different level of investment, I think. Yeah. And actually one of the um, articles that you posted a while ago, Nate, on Facebook, 
what you were saying reminded me of that, of choose your pain. I mean, in some way, shape or form, you're going to have some pain at some point. You're going to experience jealousy no matter what kind of relationship structure you're in. You're going to encounter communication problems. You're going to encounter scheduling problems. I mean, no matter what, you're going to encounter an issue and it's a matter of choosing which direction that pain is and what you feel you're going to get the most benefit out of. And that's really kind of the direction. Yes, you're checking in a lot more often with your partners. Yes, I mean, in my case, I have a weekly scheduling meeting that most people apparently think is pretty insane. In fact, I'll link to an article about it. Um, but really it comes down to the fact that it's choosing what benefit you want to get out of something and what work is required to get there. And if you're somebody who's really uncomfortable in monogamy, then is the pain of monogamy really worth the benefit you get versus the pain of checking in constantly with multiple partners worth the benefit you're going to get out of it? I think it's a great point. And I'm just really geeking out over the fact that you have a weekly scheduling meeting because I feel like most families and couples and even businesses could stand to infuse that into their lives. So I'm just yet another reason why I want to be your groupies. Aww. You're, you're going to make me blush here. <laughs> I think, um, so we're talking about ethical non-monogamy, which is also, it depends, there's a lot of labels for it. There's all sorts of different versions of polyamory that go with that. I posted this really adorable little like cartoon sketch on Twitter earlier today that I found in my research. It has like, I think it was a dozen different versions of ethical non-monogamy. But Amy brought up something here. Um, she said that like people have work wives and work husbands, which I totally like legit had, there was a guy at work who was gay, but wasn't out. And everybody called him my work husband to the point where they legit thought that we had, we were dating and we're like in a real relationship. And she has a good point that people tend to create those uh, tight connections, whether it's at work where it's like a legit work spouse or even a close friendship or whatever. And she said, isn't that non-monogamy? And I guess for me, the way I look at it, and I think the way broadly people see it is monogamy refers to your sexual relationship. And I think what you're referring to and pointing to Amy is the idea of having these platonic relationships, which I do. I have, I'm, my best friend is more than my best friend. I call her my platonic wife. Thanks to some viewpoints from Andrea at some point along the way. Um, because it is, it's, it's a deeper friendship and we, we aren't intimate. So it's not necessarily a non-monogamous conversation. It's more of a relationship conversation. And that I think is really common. There's a lot of societies outside of the U S where communal living and really tight friendships and relationships that go beyond what the U S is able to comprehend is pretty normal. Um, yeah. I mean, polyamory is the historically is the most common relationship structure. If you go back through the thousands of years and you look at like tribal Africa and that's just how people operated. It's like not, it's not a foreign concept. It's foreign for us because we've been so acclimatized to Judeo Christian monogamous lifestyle. That's just culturally the norm. And it has been for so long that this thing, this other relationship structure is completely outside our realm of comfort, I think is the big, the big thing. It's it makes people really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Tony asked, um, how does that differ from a best friend? Um, so for me, when I say best friend, I I can go out, to, and Tony, you, you know me personally, so you've probably seen this unfold. I can go out with a group of friends and have like six people describe me as their best friend. And half of them I've known for like three weeks, right? Like the term best friend gets thrown around, very, especially since BFF and texting, and it's just gotten to be so overused in my opinion, um, it doesn't do justice to the relationship that I have with Sarah. So not only are we really tight friends, but like we talk to each other about life decisions. You know, like I will consult, I consulted her before buying this house. She came to see it before I chose to purchase. She got a new car recently and I was very involved in her budgeting and how she chose to purchase it and what she purchased. And, you know, we're like, we're just very involved in each other's lives in a way that most friends or best friends aren't. And we have a commitment to stay that way. And I had somebody say like, isn't that like bros before hoes kind of thing? But it's it just goes deeper than that. And I think it's just a really personal thing. So for me, um, that connection is important enough that it, you, it, it qualifies for a distinct descriptor. Um, um, and, my, and my romantic partner has to get that and deal with that and integrate into that, right? So it just, it's a different level. What you got, Andrea? Oh, I was just going to say the uh, comment she made of being from an older generation, it's what she'd refer to as a best friend. I, 
I think that that has a completely valid understanding of friendship. There's also the, uh, and I can't remember the exact line I wrote in the article that you found me through, um, but it's uh, part of the whole idea of a marriage having to involve sex is one of the things that I actually really like to challenge because asexual individuals or couples who are living together in two separate cities or many of the relationship structures that actually work for people don't necessarily include sex as a part of a marriage or sex as a part of a relationship. If it's what you need in a relationship and if that's part of you and your, you and your partner's relationship, all the more power to you. But if two asexual people can get married and call each other husband and wife and be completely happy, then why should I necessarily have to limit myself to calling or limit anybody to calling their best friend who really they have a more marriage-like relationship with so anything other than their wife or their husband or their work wife or platonic wife or however they choose to refer to them. I don't think that necessarily connecting marriage and sex is the healthiest either because there are some people out there who are asexual or demisexual or just sex isn't a part of that relationship. Yeah. Who have lots and lots of sex, but don't actually connect with them and create a meaningful relationship, right? So, yeah, I think that I think that for a lot of people, the two need to be joined at some point. But I think as a society, we've over merged the two conversations. I don't think they have to be joined. Go for it, Nate. What you got? I wouldn't have expected. Uh, Andrea, that. have you read uh, Have you read the book Mating in Captivity by Esther Perel? Yes. Yep. Super fascinating book. Love yeah. that book. Right there. <laughs> I've got it in my room too. Uh, and I like I like that she challenges the way that we think about fidelity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's like, who, who, so why can we? Why do we scorn a man or a woman who is faithful for you know forty years of their 20, 20 years of their forty year marriage and they cheat once and they're always labeled as a cheater, whereas somebody who gets married and then divorced and then married and divorced and married and divorced and has like three or four different sexual partners during those relationships, why are they? Like there's nothing wrong with that. So serial monogamy, when you are with somebody and, and then have sex and break up and then with somebody and have sex and break up, that's not, that's not frowned upon in our culture. And you can be involved in like a 60 year relationship and have, a, have one affair and all of a sudden you're not faithful. You know, is there a such thing as monogamish? Is there a thing, should we redefine, redefine fidelity as like being faithful most of the time? or being honest in your infidelity, or is you can have the conversation like, what if, what if somebody goes through a period of their life where they're really low desire? Like what if a woman goes through menopause and it affects her body such that she doesn't have a high sexual desire anymore? Is it okay for her and her husband to come to an agreement that, that they can maintain their relationship, but he can have a sexual relationship outside of their marriage as long as it doesn't become emotional? Or like, there's all sorts of these different constructs that are worth considering and talking about. Um, that I think I, I think that the the beliefs and the ideas that we have around sexual fidelity, uh, we would do well to kind of question and talk about uh, because I don't know. There's just a lot. There's it's it's not black and white. Like yep. relationships are so gray and it's so dependent on the parties involved and what their desires are and what works best for them. And I think we're so scared to challenge that and say we want something outside the norm, culturally speaking, that we just kind of like stick to what's super comfortable, yep. which I don't necessarily agree with. Well, we're doing so. it. I've got an entire taboo talk scheduled on sexuality, um, February 25th, actually. Um, Amy's saying, isn't that sort of wiggle room in how monogamy is practiced in America? And that's well, say that one more time. She said, isn't there, but there isn't that sort of wiggle room in how monogamy is practiced in America. So like you were talking about like, what about all of these different scenarios? And I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm paraphrasing Amy here because she's eating dinner and won't join us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what she's saying is like, there, I know that I, I personally know people who have what looks like a traditional um, marriage, but behind the scenes, they have specific arrangements to accommodate their sexuality, but it's not okay to talk about it. Like if somebody yeah. is diagnosed as paraplegic, there's not a lot of room to talk about publicly the fact that the wife might be seen in public with other men because she can't, you know, then that's okay. Right. So then it becomes this big gossip thing. Um, 
I think there's room for more conversation, more acceptance around that. Um, I think there might be some some divorces that get avoided. Well, and I think that ties in extraordinarily well to the idea of commitment, because at the point you, not to make a pun, but divorce, marriage, and commitment, then that commitment is really a bigger part of the question, because nobody will ever, or very few people will question the commitment of somebody who stays with a partner who is a paraplegic or has low desire or any of the other things. They never question that commitment until there is a sexual infidelity. And so that's one of the things that really is intriguing to me because commitment, people seem to have a little bit more openness to talking about what is a commitment, whereas talking about what is a marriage is very cut and dry and partially due to the legal definition, but that whole commitment being able to be something other than you are my everything. Which is a very, it's, which is also a very American concept. That's another, something else Esther Perel talks about. She, if you listen to her episode a couple of months ago, they did an episode on the, the TED podcast mm -hmm. on love. And she had a segment there. And um, one of the things she talks about is like the idea that, that your husband or wife or your partner or whatever in, in the United States, we have this idea that they are, um, that they need to be your pr protector, your provider, your confidant, your best friend, your lover. And we have like all of these things wrapped into one person. And she's like, since when, when I go to Europe, your best friend is your best friend and your husband is your husband. And they're not the same thing, but we're so fixated on this one person meeting all of our needs where if you go back two or three generations, those needs were met by, those needs were met by a community. Absolutely. You know, you had friends who helped you, like you helped each other raise your kids. You helped each other make a living. You know, you you traded, you bartered. It was such a com such a communal life. And now you look at the way that America is now. The average household income hasn't gone up a whole lot in the last fifty years, but the average house size has like more than tripled. I think was the t statistic I saw the other day. So we're becoming more and more isolated, which means we're relying more and more on the people who are closest to us to fulfill all these many varied, many and varied needs, which I feel like is super unfair. Um, it's like you want, it's there's to so the point much, now. There's so much juice in what you're saying, Nate. There's like a whole bunch of issues that you're talking, you're, you're touching on, you know, there's, Oh over man, I'm, I'm opening up a whole can of worms. I know. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> but to circle back to what Andrew was saying, um, it, that's why I tend towards a more communal, polyamorous view of relationships specifically because I don't want or expect one person to be my everything, right? Like I, I want the freedom and the language and the, the context for being clear that I don't have one person who fulfills everything for me. And that either gets me labeled as like super independent or unable to commit or and I don't care, right? Everybody's going to have the conversation they're going to have, but because of the way our society views commitment and relationships and romance, my comfort with that makes others uncomfortable. Um, and it, it just kind of makes me wonder how many of those people are doing that, are putting their everything on one person. And for some people, it totally works. And I think there's others where that, you know, there's room for exploration and, and there probably is a desire to explore and there's just not a great conversation for it. Well, and part of me honestly wonders, I mean, what was being said earlier about, well, back in the day, I'm in my generation, we called that a best friend. Part of me wonders if the move towards saying, no, this is a legitimate relationship, either as a additional partner or whether it's a poly group or wh whatever, is a pushback against that. You know, it used to be called best friend, but now that we're saying our marriage is everything and that is my everything because we are so isolated, it's a pushback of saying, no, this person is not my everything. I have multiple partners of whatever description or definition, best friend, sexual, not whatever. And that's kind of a pushback towards the, I am not an isolated individual and I don't expect my partner to partner or partners to be other or be that as well. I think it's a swing back towards the community living that Nate was referencing, which is why marriage wasn't looked to be your everything you had. And part of, I mean, there's so many things that contribute to that, right? Social standards, social standards changing, household sizes is changing. But, you know, back in the day, the men went off to work and the women all gathered around. And even just in the fifties, women all communicated and had like little tribes around the town that just doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's been a big societal shift. And I think that to an extent there could be easily be an argument or a conversation made that, the move 
like there's a, a subtle movement in ethical non-monogamy, polyamory and communal living, that kind of stuff, that it is just a swing back towards, you know, trying to balance that out. Um, there's some chat going on and I, Isabel brought up something that, that was also brought up on Facebook. So she asked, what's the purpose or benefit of monogamy? So evolutionarily speaking, it was beneficial for the women to be supported by men. But now that we have birth control, she's wondering what are the benefits of monogamous commitment? And I want to kind of tie that over and bridge to um, somebody was asking to have to see us have a conversation about the idea of a woman having multiple husbands, which I loved because it led me down this path of research where I found out that it's called Adelphic polyandry. And there are there were thought to be only a couple of places in like um, Tibet and Nepal where this happened. But recently, a couple of different researchers have gone down the path and figured out that there was quite a few communities that did this and they were farming communities. So having one woman at home taking care of the household and technically owning the property she could have multiple husbands that could then farm more property. They could produce um, more children and take care of it, which I guess produce more children, need more women, but that was the way the article was written. I can share it in the chat, but um, yeah, that's a good point that we talk a lot about the sister wives and big love, but there hasn't been a lot of conversation about it going the opposite direction. And evolutionarily speaking, I don't know, what is the purpose of monogamy? Do you have an opinion on that one, Nate? You've got your little cute smirk going on. Yeah, I do. But, I want to touch before I touch on this. I, lessons, what? I, ha I have to, huh. um, I feel like I, I need to like just interject one quick thing in the thing and what we were just talking about in, in, in the, the redefinition of monogamy or, or uh, ethical non-monogamy. And one thing that I just like really felt the urge to say is I think it's kind of sad that we have to, that there's, there seems to be such a cultural push away from identifying yourself as monogamous so you can have these other types of relationships, like a best friend or like a platonic husband or wife or whatever. Um, I don't, it just, I feel like monogamy has a really bad rap and I'm trying to rebrand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, I see so much potential in monogamy and I don't, I don't think, I don't think that like being monogamous means you can't have a best friend and I don't think it means you can't have friends that are of the opposite gender or I don't think it can't mean that you can't have friends that you're attracted to. There's just like, well, that's why I love Andreas kind of starting to separate the sex from the relationship because right. I think, I think you're, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different configurations. I just, just want to, I, I think the thing that I just wanted to hit on is like, it's okay. It's okay you to be. Monogamy. It's good for lots of people. Yeah, Yay, it's okay monogamy. to be monogamous. Like you, you can still identify as being monogamous and still have those types of relationships. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, totally. So, um, that's that's all. So back to the question that you asked me um, about what's the benefit of being monogamous? Yeah, well, and, and just tying in the idea of having yeah. like, there's tribes all over the place where men have multiple wives. I just posted the article about a woman having multiple husbands and the benefits that that has. What do you think that besides social and media pressure, what do you think moved us towards monogamy as a whole? Um, and you're allowed to not have an opinion. Like we can just talk about how cool it is that there's places where people have multiple husbands. Cause I was pretty stoked to figure oh, that that's out. That's cool. I, I mean, if you look at this, the studies show that people who are married uh, have more sex, they have a higher household income. They live longer lives. Uh, they tend to be happier people, especially if they're happily married. Um, they they have better health. So the benefit of being married, whether or not, I guess you could argue that non-monogamous relationships could have those same benefits. Um, I haven't actually seen studies on non-monogamous relationships and the, those the the long-term effects, uh, culturally speaking. But I think that there's just because. Um, just because monogam, just because historically speaking, women benefited from the protection and providing of the of a monogamous male in their in their relationship, doesn't mean that there's not benefits today. Um, the same benefits or the benefits may may be different or may have evolved, but I think that humans are not designed to be alone, and um, there's we're a tribal people and it's good to be with somebody totally yeah um 
So whether or not that argument can be po can be posed specifically for monogamy or just partnership in general, uh, whatever your, that partnership looks like, I think is up, up for debate. Um, so that's kind of where I stand right now. If I have more to say, I'll say it, but I so want to read some I, of these comments. Yeah, so a quick, I'm actually posting a link uh, to an article there. It's one of many that I would be happy to send you later. Um, going down the rabbit hole of research on polyamorous relationships. Yeah, that'd be great. Actually, a really great body of research it's, that's starting to come out about that. It's a, it's um, an area of interest of mine that I haven't spent a lot of time in. I'll admit that I'm like not super informed when it comes to polyandry. So, yeah, and there's actually a really great um, the book Sex at Dawn. I'm I'm guessing somebody out there has heard of it. I've read um, it. It's a really great um, start to talk about what the evolutionary expectation of monogamy actually is or isn't because right now it's really interesting yeah it's literally it is on our pods like if you want to date us in the long term then here's your reading list um, which is probably a little mean but you know um and so it's it talks about the fact that monogamy and evolution aren't necessarily tightly connected that connection has been attempted to be made in several times and places and through a lot of scientific research that connects us to voles even though we have so little in relation to voles and anything except monogamy and they're not even sexually monogamous I mean, there's a lot of research out there saying that monogamy isn't necessarily the evolutionary choice even if it is a totally valid choice and completely legitimate choice when entered into purposefully but it's not the evolutionary choice and amy's pointing out there's a big difference between an evolutionary development and, and a cultural, cultural development, development. yeah, yeah. And I think and I agree. If, and, and, if we look at the overpopulation in a lot of the planet, and I mean, there's, there's, that's a whole other conversation. There's places that aren't overpopulated. I get it. Don't attack me out there. But if we look at the overpopulation in the developed parts of the planet, theoretically, there would be an evolutional evolutionary shift away from monogamy and towards like something that would cause us to reproduce less. And that's not happening. I think cultural influences are having a much stronger um, weight right now. Yeah, I will, I'll definitely admit that my my propensity to lean more towards monogamy probably has a huge amount to do with my upbringing, with with my family, with my community, with my religion, and um, like I'll openly admit that that like I've read Sex at Dawn. I know that the humans are not biologically programmed to be monogamous, and that's okay. It's yeah. So it's it's really interesting it's an interesting conversation to have that something that doesn't come naturally to you can be a preference. Oh, and there's plenty of things that don't come naturally to human beings that we do every day. Yeah, like pooping your pants. Like, well, you know, <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, I was more thinking things like, you know, if our particular eating choices and, or even the fact that we use something other than our voices to communicate. I mean, you could make a very strong evolutionary argument that the switch from, yeah, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> but the switch from a, a species that communicated via voice and a species that communicates very, via written forms is actually a big part of what caused some brain changes. Um, Leonard Shalane's uh, The Alphabet and the Goddess is a really great read um, to talk about this. But so much of what we choose to do has nothing to do with our evolutionary benefit. It's a, I, I have to admit that like it's sometimes really difficult for me to uh how do i put this because i do have such strong beliefs personally for like why i make the choices i make and also like religious beliefs it's sometimes hard for me because i like i come in conflict with like does that sometimes the things that I know and the things that I believe come in conflict with each other and it creates a really interesting um, an interesting situation ditto yeah <laughs> in about a dozen ways I mean I grew up in a very specific uh, religious group um, or at least around a very specific religious group when I was being raised and while I didn't necessarily share those beliefs I even now, I mean, the things that I believe about either my religion or about the world or about spirituality or the fact that I believe that I'll have oatmeal for breakfast tomorrow versus what evidence may show, like I don't have any oatmeal in the house, 
there's a constant tension there. And I think that tension is where it gets really interesting. Yeah. And it's hard to have a conversation like this for me sometimes without saying, Oh, and also this is what it like, this is my belief. Like <clears throat> a lot of this has to do with like the, my belief in a, in a God and like what, what and there's nothing wrong with that though. Like that's what no. all of our opinion. It's totally, and, but also, but, but like that, that conversation doesn't, I'm not the person that's going to th enforce my beliefs on other people or force my beliefs on other people. Totally. Because and I, I that's totally who I know you to be like, I would never see right. you do it. And, but it's and just you inform your, uh, your opinion is totally, doesn't I'm make just you observing. I'm just observing like the conflict that I experience while like, I, I, I believe it. everybody has the right to choose like what's best for them. And I believe that like, X, Y, and Z can work, but I also believe that X is what's right for me and for my community and for my people, even though Y might be like what's right for you, even though there's no judgment about it, like the reasoning that I have for it is based on something that like most people wouldn't even understand. So it's just like a really, it's a, it's that's an interesting weird. conversation to be having. Yeah, Amy yeah. says that's what like we're my not. brain is really my brain is being stretched right now having this conversation. <laughs> so I'm glad we're having it. And I think that right there, you right there described commitment in in not so many words, but Ooh, yeah. the fact. That, you know, I mean, you know something because you have your reasons to believe it, and you are committed to those ideas, and mm -hmm. that is beautiful and awesome. But you're also not going to say because this is what I believe, this must be everybody else's reality. I mean, that right there is ultimate commitment because you are not so insecure in your beliefs that everybody else must share them for them to be real. And we haven't even really touched on the idea of commitment. I like the way you said that. That was good. <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant, Andrea. You took, you took, oh, that's it's entirely processing me. face. <laughs> Got it. It's when it goes kind of like. I'm going to give you some of these. <laughs> so, okay. So there's one last question that we haven't really um, covered that was, that was adamantly brought up in the in the chat previously um it's a little bit lighter i think it's a little bit more comfortable and less for nate um but i actually i'm going to direct it to you andrea so inside of a marriage or a committed romantic relationship what can happen what the question was how do you have a marriage without conflict <laughs> i'm gonna reword that question since having been married for a significant amount of time i know that that's just <laughs> no possible um <laughs> what role, what role do you think conflict has in uh, a <laughs> I, I love Nate's laugh. I'm just gonna let the evil laugh go for a minute. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> giving all um. respect <laughs> Nate, breathe. <laughs> Nate okay. is laughing. Because I asked how you have a marriage without conflict for those of you who are trying to figure out what's happening right now. So I, giving all respect to the person who asked that question, because to some extent, if they're asking that question, they think it's a possibility. Well, if you're it's, young and have never been married, totally. Yeah. Um, I think the really- Robot love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am an automaton robot. <laughs> well, so that's why I shifted the question. So what role yeah. does conflict have in a healthy relationship if it's not, possible to eradicate it, what world does it have? Right. So I think that in my world, the benefit of, and my belief is the benefit of conflict in a relationship is that it gives you an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the person you are in conflict with, both in a marriage and in a relationship, and even in any kind of relationship, be it a work relationship or anything else, is when there is conflict, you are given an opportunity. And it's a matter of how you handle that opportunity and how you approach that opportunity that really indicates how and where that relationship is either going or needs to go or should be going. Because at the point there's conflict, then that means that there is some kind of passion behind it or there is some kind of really ded dedication to that idea. And that My my first response is, why would you want to get rid of conflict? That's where makeup sex comes from. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I'm going to slide right by that particular con conversation for a variety of reasons. <laughs> but like, to your point, though, there, there's passion there. Like, passion is important. And sometimes you need conflict to bring that up and to bring up the debate and to keep things lively. Like, totally. 
and to understand change. I mean, expecting a human being to be static for the rest of their life is ridiculous. And at the point there's no conflict, then that means you are both so static or you are all so static that there's no, there's no conflict, which is just, that means you're not changing. Oh, Nate. <laughs> so here's my here's my take on conflict. Can I can I drop some knowledge here? Please that do. Would be awesome. uh, I would just want to echo what Andrea said. The conflict is an opportunity for you to express empathy, to learn uh, like understanding. If you look at the research, the Gottman Institute, John John and Julie Gottman have been doing relationship research for decades and decades and decades. And if they're he's like the Freud of of romantic love. And um, he's, he's been able to predict with the 93% accuracy whether or not a couple will stay together or break up by watching them argue for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that a couple handles conflict determines what their relationship is going to look like. And conflict is actually one of the greatest opportunities you have as a partnership to come together. It, it basically de determines whether or not you stay together it's probably the highest determining factor of whether or not you stay together or, or break up. 69% um, of conflict in relationships is unresolvable. Why are you, you laughing? I'm sorry. Because I said 69, I knew it. I knew that's why you were laughing. <laughs> Accurate statistic though. Um, that means like there are problems that don't go away, which a lot of people struggle with because historically, if you think about the first 21 years of your life, you're raised in a culture and in a society where when you're presented with a problem, it has a solution. If you think of your entire schooling, there's a right way to spell a word and a wrong way to spell a word. There's a one right answer to the math problem. There's, you get a multiple choice quiz on history, there's one right answer. If you get uh, an English class, there's one right way to like structure your sentence and to like structure an essay. And like you're just given all the right answers, you're given here's the test and like you need to get the answers right and everything else is wrong. But when you get into life, problems don't just have a right and a wrong answer. It's like problems don't get solved, they get managed. So if you, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is in-laws. Like when you, a lot of people get married and like your in-laws just don't disappear. And sometimes they're frustrating as all get out. Like they are the bane of your existence. They make your life horrible and they don't just go away. It's a problem that gets managed forever and ever and ever until somebody dies. And sometimes the sooner the better. My um, sister is watching us right now, so I'm like really giggling. <laughs> Well, we love that sister-in-law. We do. She's the good kind of in-law. So the point, the point is, is that there is no such thing as a relationship without conflict and that how you handle conflict determines the outcome of your relationship. And the conflict that you experience more than anything is an opportunity for you to turn towards each other and strengthen each other. I've, I've interviewed hundreds of couples all over the country over the last several years. And one of the most fascinating things that I've discovered is there's not one amazing couple who hasn't been through a major time of trial. Like all of the most amazing couples, the reason they're so amazing is because they've been able to turn towards each other and rely on each other and lean on each other in times of difficulty and, and duress, you know, in bankruptcy, losing a child, losing a home, uh, like calamities and natural disasters. Um, like these huge life, major illnesses, par paralysis, like major life threatening, horrible things have happened to people. And the reason that their relationships are so strong and so vibrant now is because they've been able to work through those things and learn to manage them and learn to be adv advocates for each other and learn to work together instead of wor work against each other. They fight they fight with each other instead of against each other to tackle the problems of life. And I think that's the beauty of a relationship. And that's a skill. Once again, if we go back to the skills thing, it's a skill that's learned. Mm -hmm. And it's not an instinctual thing. When you feel threatened, the most logical thing to do is fight or flight. Like that's the mechanism that kicks in physiologically. And if you want to have a successful relationship, you have to overcome the fight or flight mechanism that occurs naturally in your brain. Most people don't understand that. Most people aren't willing to do the training and put in the effort to like really develop that skill of like, holy crap, I'm being triggered right now. I can feel my adrenaline starting to pump and my pupils starting to dilate and my heart starting to beat. Maybe now's not a good time to talk about a sensitive subject. Like it's a difficult thing to learn. But if you can learn to manage that, that's that's like the beauty of relationships. It's it's self mastery, and um, I tell people if what you if what you're looking for is happiness, relationships are not for you. But if what you're looking for is growth and progress and improve self improvement, a relationship is the best best place that you can turn. 
Mm-hmm. So um, emotional intelligence, yes, I'll give you three cheers for that. Yeah. So that's that's my soapbox as far as a conflict-free relationship goes. The only re- I knew relationship you were gonna, I knew you were gonna have something juicy for us on that one. The only relationship that's conflict-free is a, an abusive relationship, in my opinion. It's a really good way to put it. It's yeah. A, yeah. Because somebody's always somebody's always submitting and um, allowing themselves to be walked on and may have decisions made for them, and um, it's not healthy. Yeah. Yeah. So, Andrea. Yes. You have this, like, I know, I'm letting you breathe. So, Andrea, you have this, like, <laughs> you've brought up a couple of really great books and resources. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that, that the idea of, of slightly outside the norm relationships is not a new subject for you. Is there an area that we haven't touched on or a resource that you really think people who are wanting to tiptoe into or explore if that type of a lifestyle is good for them. Is there something that you would want to share with everybody or a topic you'd want to touch on that we haven't yet? Oh, I don't think there's particularly a topic that we haven't touched on. I mean, we touched on a lot of it. The expectation is not necessarily where you need to go. Um, Sex at Dawn is one of my favorite books. So is Opening Up. Um, That's a great option of a book. I can't remember the author off the top of my head. Um, Honestly, listening to some some of Dan Savage's uh, either talks or some of his writings about being monogamish is an incredibly good one. Uh, believe it or not, the Reddit polyamory board is a really good place to go because people there will definitely lay down their unfiltered opinions, including about unicorn hunting and how that will not save your relationship. Um, but yeah, there's a lot can of great you, places. Can you quickly define what a unicorn is? Because I know a lot of people just totally got excited and thought of like glitter and pooping sure. and well, those sort of to be fair, I've been a unicorn and I do actually like glitter. So there's that. But, um, but no, um, unicorn in a polyamorous relationship or really a lot of non-monogamous relationships, a unicorn is a bisexual, completely single female who is into both of you and wants nothing more than to be the savior of your relationship or even just have sex with both of you. Um, and and the- unicorn because it's a fairly rare find. It's right? an incredibly rare find. It's... A, it's incredibly difficult. B, the fact that usually the unicorn is expected to save a relationship or be in a polyfidelitous and just commit to all of you together and nothing else. Yeah, unicorns are very rare for a reason. So yeah, um, that. but really it comes down to don't be afraid to ask a question and don't be afraid to be stupid and don't be afraid to be honest about where you are because you never know unless you ask a partner. I mean, the first time I told my now husband that I was not monogamous and that I actually maybe had a few things that we should talk about. I fully expected him to say, you know what, I'm done, I'm out. And instead his response was, really? Yes. And it's a matter of making yourself that vulnerable. And so it's okay to be vulnerable because that's what makes for a stronger relationship. Yeah, and I'm going to piggy veggie back off of that. Why the pig <laughs> don't eat it? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna- to... Take take that and run with it a little bit further, and say that if if the if you're looking at your existing relationship and wondering if it needs to pivot or if it's working, the best place to start is a conversation. Especially if you're in a relationship, right? If you're single, it's a little bit different. You get a little bit more latitude to explore. But if you're in a relationship and you're having any thoughts that any of this might be something that fits you better than you have now, the best place to start is going to be a conversation with your partner versus going off and doing a bunch of research on your own and exploring on your own. Unless you're wanting to end your current relationship. And right. saying something or thinking about something doesn't mean that it's set in stone. It doesn't mean that it's real. It doesn't mean that you've made a decision. It means that you want to talk about it. What did I do, Nate? You just you just went like nothing. Oh, okay. Um, but before we log off, I want to list some resources of my own as well. Yes, please. In fact, I'm gonna even though we're wrapping up, I'm gonna leave it open for a few minutes. So if you guys have stuff that you want to throw in the chat, I'm gonna use it later to put together a resource cool. list. Um, And anybody who's still watching, who's watching the replay, if you go to tabutalk.us and throw your email address in there, I'm going to send an email out once a week that has a link to, this could be a weekly conversation, different topic every week. So if you go to tabutalk.us and sign up, I'm just going to send an email out that has links to all the stuff that we referenced during today. And then next week, you'll get a link to watch next week. And same thing, I'll just try to include as many resources as I can. And I might end up just putting them all on a web page. We'll see. But if you sign up there and give me your email, I'll email you that. Um, and you can always unsubscribe. I'm not going to spam you, send you junk. Um, it's really just so you can keep up with the taboo talks. 
Um, but yeah, add all of your stuff here. And uh, thank you, John, for putting a link to Taboo Talk. Um, yeah, and like you can, uh, you put in monogamish or polyamory or polyandry or even unicorn relationship into Google and you can disappear for a really long time. And there's some really good TED Talks. There's really good resources. Um, if it's stuff that you've been wondering about, the internet is a wonderful way to sit down with your partner and start kind of exploring what's out there in a safe way. And I also think that there's a lot out there about healthy monogamous relationships and healthy, you know, healthy communication. Word. Healthy. Yes. A monogamous relationship can be a very, very, very beautiful thing when, yeah. uh, when done right. So small, if I can beg a little, uh, latitude to tell a small personal story. My parents have been monogamously, as far as I know, married for almost 40 years now. And my dad's very favorite quote, he was being interviewed by a television station on Valentine's Day. And they were asking couples that had been together for a very long time, what their secret was and all that kind of stuff. And my mom told this very long involved story about, you know, it's about open communication and having the same goals and doing, you know, all of this hard work. And then they turned to my dad and said, so what's your secret for a long relationship? And he said, when I wake up in the morning and she's there, I decide to deal with it. <laughs> and I think that right there is a secret. I, it, it's honestly about making that decision every single day, no matter what your relationship is. You choose what you love, love what you choose. Yep. Yeah. Out of curiosity, Nate, how long have your parents been together? 34 years. Yeah. My parents have been together for f almost, what, 44 years now. <laughs> Just for context. Yeah. We're also actually, that's really interesting that all three of us have parents that are together and together for a long time. Because in our generation, that is weird. Mm -hmm. My entire my entire family and extended family is that way. My grandparents are all married, still together, uh, still alive. Mm -hmm. All of my aunts and uncles wow. married, still together, no divorces. <laughs> Statistically, an anomaly. I think that may also have something to do from judging what you were saying about a strong religious background that may have something to do with it too, would be my guess. Yep. I think you'd be right. And I also think that uh, judging by my experience from my experience, talking to lots of couples, generally speaking, my, my fa family and extended family has pretty, pretty decent relationships. Mm -hmm. Like they're not, I don't, I haven't ever seen any signs of like abuse or like, they're both really committed partners. They're all really committed to each other, which I think is really admirable. So that's really cool. Yeah. Anyway. Cool. I'm, yeah. All right. Do you guys, did you guys get your resources in or do you want me to like leave it open longer? For you I dropped, I dropped mine in there. Wait. If you think about it, it's really long to me. Seven principles for making marriage work and the new rules of marriage are great books for creating a foundation of relationship skills that will take you to the moon and back. <laughs> yep. Um, He's hoping for Mars. Mars and back. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, thank you for being like, we didn't have a pre call. Like, nobody knew what they were signing up for. So, thank you guys for being willing to just hop on here and play with me, especially you, Andre, since we've never done this before. Nate kind of knew what he was getting into with me. Did so, I? I don't think I did. <laughs> Oh wow! Well, thank you too. You get you get you get super props too. So yeah, thank you guys for joining me and for being willing to kind of meander through conversation about things that we don't necessarily talk about every day live on the interwebs for hundreds of people to watch. So I appreciate you guys being brave and having the courage to do that. And thanks for everybody who dropped by to participate in the chat. Yes. Um, oh, questions. Yeah. If somebody wants to do this with me, like if you want to be, if you have a topic that you want covered, or if you want to hop on one of these with me, you can go to the, the same website, tabutalk.us. You can find me on all the social media, send me a private message. I am like, this is the first one that we've done. I'm planning on doing this weekly until I run out of subjects right now. That's through the end of March. Um, but yeah, I am totally open for collaboration, ideas, speakers, people to join. Like you are more than welcome to stick your nose all up in my business with this taboo talk stuff. And I will welcome all of your input and collaboration. So yes, go to taboo talk .us, sign up. My email address will be there. You can send me a private message on social media, that kind of stuff. And, um, if you're interested in either of these guys, my coordinate, yeah, either of these guys, um, I'll get whatever contact information they're willing to provide. And I'll try to get that on that resource page as well. Um, in case you guys want to track these guys down because they have pretty awesome things to say all the time. They're worthy of 
the following. In fact, I'll say Nate has Nate has the Love You Mentory, so he's interviewed a whole bunch of people and does a podcast that is definitely worth checking out. And Andrea has a project called A Thousand Things to Discuss. Tell me, t- say a thousand things to talk about. A thousand things to talk about. She puts a discussion topic out every day, and she's getting into the podcast world a little bit with it, where she basically just stirs your brain juices in all sorts of awesome ways. They are both worthy of cyber stalking for sure. Wow. Awesome. And I really get wildly creeped out about it every now and again. It's awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you to everybody who joined us for the first taboo talk. And I will be back next week. Hopefully you guys all will as well. And next week we're going to be talking about parenting. Next week is parenting specifically related to technology and travel and how that impacts the parenting experience these days. Andrew, so. it was nice to meet you. Yeah, it was wonderful to meet you, Nate. I hope to connect more soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Are we going to hang around here for a while, or what's the deal? <laughs>